This week, I'm joined once again by Chad Haag to discuss his book, The Philosophy of Ted Kaczynski, Why the Unabomber Was Right About Modern Technology, alongside discussions of society, technology, and control. I'd like to thank all my patrons and paid subscribers for making all of this work possible, and if you'd like to support Hermetics or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Chad Haag, uh, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics podcast once again. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so we're going to be discussing your book, The Philosophy of Ted Kaczynski. Um, it might, is it pronounced Kaczynski or Kaczynski? In America, they typically say Ted Kaczynski. Ted Kaczynski, okay. So we're going to be discussing your book, The Philosophy of Ted Kaczynski, Why the Unabomber Was Right About Modern Technology. So for those of you who don't know who Ted, K- Ted Kaczynski is, um, he primarily is known as the Unabomber who was a terrorist who bombed multiple people via mail. Um, so for those of you who don't know, you are wondering why we spoke about him, Ted Kaczynski is one of the most interesting philosophers of anti-technological thought. And his manifesto was published in, uh, I believe it was the New York Times. But So there's a lot going on here with respect Back to why would we be why would we be talking about this? Why would we be talking about him? Um, so why did you write this book, Chad? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to have this discussion today. Um, I wrote the book about Ted Kaczynski because he's one of the greatest thinkers alive today, and arguably one of the most important of at least the past century. Um, but despite the fact that the so-called Unabomber has nearly universal name recognition. Kaczynski himself remains, I think, the single most underappreciated uh, thinker in terms of actually doing justice to the substance of his ideas. The irony about him is he's arguably the most overexposed uh, person in the sense that there's no shortage of media representations of him, even including a, a new Netflix series from a few years ago, which has kind of retold the urban legend of the Unabomber for a whole new generation of viewers. And yet he's the most underexposed person in the sense that it's possible to watch a number of these uh, documentaries without hearing a single word about his theories as such, uh, to the extent that the manifesto is a a part of the plot line. They largely just dismiss it as uh, so many paranoid and incoherent ramblings for which they assure us, well, there's no theory there anyway. You're not missing anything. You can trust us. And I think this is a shame because his theories are both um, philosophically rigorous in a way that um, virtually no one really has uh, has uh, done justice to. No one has acknowledged, I should say. Um, but they're also original. Um, he's not just giving us uh, redundant uh, cliches of Marx, Freud, Derrida, and these other thinkers that you know the, uh, the professional intellectuals are really just running circles around on, on grounds that there's not been any new theories since those three. Um, Ted Kaczynski actually takes us in a whole new direction for thought. And that's why I thought it was absolutely necessary to, to start engaging with this work on, on a serious level. Mm-hmm. So so that was what you hoped to achieve was to place Kaczynski uh, as a serious philosopher. Right. The kind of engagement which we give to other thinkers, you know, you have this um, this uh, scholarship on, on people like, uh, like I just mentioned, Freud, Derrida, etc. Um, but we're, we're not doing that with Kaczynski. And that is unfortunate because much of what he says is actually uh, far more profound than the kind of thinkers who are, who are b- being given so much attention within the academic industry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you mentioned some stuff about Ted's biography there, um, and you spend a lot, quite a bit of time on it in the book. What do you think then that we, we collectively get wrong about it? Well, if you examine the documentaries, they usually dismiss the alleged crimes with uh, one of two uh, sort of um, explanations. They either say that oh, it's just me- mental illness. Um, if only somebody had been monitoring Ted Kaczynski when he was a child and had recognized the signs of that he had potential for this sort of uh, violent behavior, we could have just um, medicated the problem away and we never would have had a unibomb. So it's a not so subtle uh, infomercial for a pharmaceutical industry, but also kind of a a surveillance program for all children to be examined in that way. So you have that explanation. But in addition, you have um, the 
idea that, well, it wasn't even really mental illness. He was just a bad guy. And uh, the irony is that I actually grew up in um, the same town in uh, Colorado where Ted Kaczynski has been in prison. I'm from uh, Florence where Supermax is located. And I personally knew people who, uh, I guess, basically worked directly with him in the prison. And the idea within the town is that a certain percentage of people are you know, just born sociopaths and you can't rehabilitate them. You can't negotiate with them. It's, uh, there's no point in listening to what they have to say. All you can do is lock them up. And this was actually institutionalized in the educational system. I, when I was a kid, you'd, you'd learn this in school. And that is indeed how uh, many people who are, even work directly with him, uh, I think, feel about the situation. But the thing which we get wrong in um, in, in these sorts of approaches to him is that we act as though he stopped being a rigorous thinker after he left academia. Um, the standard story, even in like goodwill hunting, is that, well, he was doing rigorous work um, in, in mathematics and then he stopped and he lost his mind, went into the forest and he became a criminal. Um, but that's actually, I think, uh, missing the point that he kept doing the sort of work of the highest standard of rationality, even after he left the academy, in that if you examine his uh, later work, like uh, Anti-Tech Revolution, Why and How, that really is something like uh, Euclidean geometry that gives you the possible and impossible objects, not, not just on a mathematical level, as, as he surely did when, in his earlier uh, career. Um, he does it on a political level, which is maybe even more difficult. Um, for example, he shows you that a social system which can predict its own behavior is rationally impossible because it would violate Russell's paradox, which says a system basically can't talk about itself. He shows us that um, the real refutation for Fermi's paradox is simply that the uh, um, point at which a technological civilization could attempt intergalactic space travel would arrive after they had already self-destructed. Um, and he shows us that a political movement, which would be powerful enough to make a major historical change, and, and keep in mind, uh, undoing the technological system would be arguably the biggest in history, um, that would be possible. But soon after, uh, corruption would become inevitable in the same way that it had for, say, political parties, uh, academic industry, etc. Therefore, a political movement which was powerful enough to make that change, but not yet so powerful that it inevitably became corrupt, is kind of like an exotic element which you know scientists can engineer to exist for a handful of nanoseconds in a laboratory before disappearing. It's kind of like that. And it's possible, but you really have to have something um, to offer more than just preaching. Uh, because when the moment comes, it'll be gone fairly soon. So this is um, arguably the rational justification for uh, his own extremely controversial stance on taking practical action against the system. Uh, we dismiss it usually as irrationality, but it was precisely on rational grounds of the highest standard of intellectual rigor that he arrived at this sort of uh, vision for how things were to be done. So what do you what do you make of his um, his murders then? I can say on a purely philosophical level that Kaczynski's understanding of violence as uh, something which uh, is prohibited um, uh, in a, a certain way under modern technology, which was is historically anomalous compared to other civilizations, uh, his understanding of violence in this context is largely that it serves a technical function for the system. Violence is one more unpredictable element which the technological system is hardwired to either coerce into uh, being another part of its own uh, system or to eliminate outright. And we don't actually lose violence, by the way, when that happens. We simply transfer the right to use it to the technological system itself. It's absolutely absurd to say that the technological system is not violent. If you just think about all of the, uh, the uh, technological um, uh, investment into warfare, for example, um, not to mention the violence against nature, which you know somebody like Penty Linkola would, would uh, emphasize, all of the animals in the wild that are being killed by the technological system is, is an enormous amount of violence, but we don't really care about that because our um, understanding of the kind of violence which is legitimate and illegitimate, um, Kaczynski would argue, is, is largely just reiterating the technical requirements of the system itself. 
So you think that Kaczynski's philosophy is um, not anthropocentric, that, uh, that all life is considers, considered as the same? I think that uh, Kaczynski considered natural life to be something of a good in itself, far beyond preserving um, only the human uh, version of it. Okay. Um, so perhaps it's a touchy question, but, but do, you, do you support what Ted did then or not? I can tell you on a purely philosophical level that um, Kaczynski's um, arguments regarding violence um, as uh, something which is selectively condemned in cases where it inhibits the technological system and then openly endorsed, no matter how grotesque it might be when it furthers it. That's something which I think anybody approaching the, the question has to consider before they make judgments about it. Uh, so you think the, the logic in relation to Ted's practical action is caught up in some sort of um, archaic humanism? I think that um, Ted Kaczynski's uh, own view on violence is that it is something which is, in fact, natural, as uh, he cites the example of an ecosystem with no violence would actually um, uh, self-destruct because the prey would eat up everything. So the idea that violence is something which only exists when humans become bad and introduce it into the world, it's something which um, somebody uh, observing nature for a very short amount of time would realize that that's not true. Okay, okay. Um, one thing that people don't, um, don't, don't seem to, wouldn't understand about Ted that I found really interesting when I first started reading him is that the, the, the first sort of part of the manifesto, um, Industrial Society and Its Future, um, actually begins with a, one of the best critiques of leftism I've ever read. Now, why is, Ted's, why is leftism for Ted extremely Im important as something to critique, critique, and why is it tied in inherently for him with uh, the expansion of technology? So I think the first thing we need to do is um, recognize that for Ted Kaczynski, the leftist is not any group of individuals or even an ideology as such. It's a psychological type, which he says can be reliably identified on the basis of just two morphological features. These are feelings of inferiority or what Nietzsche would call ressentiment a certain self-hatred, which you uh, project outwards, and also over-socialization, which is the tendency to do what society demands, even in cases where you pretend to be rebelling against it. And the combination of these two features would be problematic in themselves, but in a historical context um, dominated by modern technology, they become something of like a psychological time bomb. Leftists have a unique psychological susceptibility to modern technology because they require the kind of collectivization you find in, in a technological society. Um, because of the uh, uh, inability they have to accomplish the kinds of things um, that they would like to want as individuals. The over-socialization inhibits uh, them from taking action um, to, as he says, go through the power process on their own. So instead they identify with a collective. And the collective, which accomplishes these uh, sort of uh, political activist uh, goals, you have the uh, legalization of a uh, gay marriage, you have um, uh, corporations promote uh, some um, uh, some content over others on, on grounds of political correctness, uh, you have uh, people deplatformed, etc. You have all of these victories, but Kaczynski emphasizes that because the satisfaction is vicarious, because it's being done by the collective rather than the individual, it's inevitably going to be incomplete. And precisely because it's an incomplete satisfaction, no matter how many victories you get, you always need more and you always need the collective to become larger. You need to um, kind of coerce any element lying outside of it to submit or be eliminated, which is the logic of technology itself by the way. And it bears mentioning that this is not only the case for um, activities that uh, seem overtly hostile, such as defeating rival political parties, etc. Even things which seem beneficent, like the agenda for social justice, require advanced technologies 
because you have to have global communications and a rapid transportation. You need surveillance. You need propaganda of a fairly sophisticated type on, on psychological grounds, etc. In order to have this um, uh, take place, the example which uh, Linkola provides, for example, of a nation on the other side of the world running out of water and uh, a, a, another nation um, flying in water from across the globe to uh, to uh, uh, save them from the ecological consequences of, of their own behavior. That's something which seems beneficent, but it still requires modern technology. And Kaczynski warns readers, uh, therefore, never to allow the movement to be swarmed by leftists, because even if it did become fashionable to attack technology in the same way that it's already kind of fashionable among them to uh, to do the same for fossil fuel companies, environmental issues, etc. Um, if leftists ever actually got control of the, uh, the system as a whole, expecting them to destroy technology at that moment would be like expecting Schmeagel to destroy the ring when he got it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's two terms you, you brought in there, which I think are really important to, to Ted's writing, which is um, one is the power process and the other one is over socialization. Um, if you, is, is it would it be possible for you to just give us an overview of what Ted means by these? Sure. So uh, the power process for Ted Kaczynski is is a need. Uh, he, ar- he argues it might be based in biology of uh, having to posit a goal, expend some effort uh, towards that goal, um, and then accomplish it. Now, ideally, you would do that with freedom, but that's not an essential component of it. And he um, uses the myth of uh, somebody who could simply wish anything he wanted into existence to show why it's actually not enough to have power. Um, If he could get anything he wanted without actually working for it, he would become bored, frustrated, and then he would lose his sanity. Pascal emphasized something similar uh, centuries ago with the example of a pathological gambler who claimed to be motivated solely by the financial reward of winning a tournament. But you could show that that's not true if you simply paid him the same amount of money to not gamble. He would feel like somebody had cheated him of what he really wanted precisely by guaranteeing that he got it. And what this shows is that power is not enough. You have to have a certain structure. And this is really not problematic in a hunter-gatherer context, for example. If your survival needs alone are enough to guarantee that you'll be expending effort to try to accomplish goals, and you'll be doing it with freedom. By the way, there is really no technological system to dictate how you're going to uh, get enough food, water, and shelter to survive in the wild. Unfortunately, under modern technology, the, the serious needs, which I just mentioned, are taken, uh, taken care of uh, by the system. And therefore, we've all basically uh, uh, become like the guy in the myth who gets what he needs without having to work for it. And this has actually created something of a dystopia in which the dissatisfaction from uh, living under these conditions where we're not able to go through the power process uh, for, for serious needs have led us to have to invent a set of activities which mimic the structure of the power process, but only in ways that don't challenge the system's dominance in all of the areas which really matter. And in fact, a surrogate activity, it was what this is called, really should enforce, uh, reinforce the technological system itself. And leftist political activism is um, arguably the ultimate example of this, because um, all of the things which they campaign for are simply ways of maximizing the technological system's efficiency and domination in disguise so do you think there's a way that we can or does ted think there's a way that you know all our all our real power has been overtaken all our basic survival functions do you think there's a way that we can once again find real power i think that uh ted kaczynski's own definition of um of freedom uh has to be understood uh, in the particularly idiosyncratic way that he meant it. And for him, freedom is defined as one cer- uh, certain mode of the power process. So for Kaczynski, there's not uh, a- anything, any such thing as the power process in the abstract. If you have it, you're either going through it with freedom, in which case you can only be uh, doing it naturally. Uh, you're doing it without interference from the technological system. That's the only way to have freedom. Um, if that's not the case, you're going through it under the domination of the technological system, and then it's a surrogate activity. So it's really one or the other. 
And because in his uh, 1971 essay, uh, Progress versus Wilderness, for example, um, he defined nature as um, that which is outside the control of the technological system. Um, there really is no way to preserve freedom and preserve technology. And even just on a political level, you consider the effects of collectivization. He mentions in his uh, essay on morality, for example, um, and uh, also within the uh, uh, Unabomber Manifesto, that there really is an inverse relation between the size of the system and the individual's power within it. Um, it even if you have two people, you already start to have a compromise, he says, uh, within the essay on morality. But of course, under modern technology, the size of the collective um, is allowed to reach global proportions in the way that it would not have been possible, um, say, during the Roman Empire. Um, the Roman Empire was limited to the land around the Mediterranean, not because they didn't want to expand it. They simply wasn't possible without modern technology. But now we have a situation in which the system is globalized and therefore the individual's power within it is um, basically non-existent. Um, by the time this happens, the decisions which really matter he says, um, such as whether your job is going to be automated out of existence, uh, whether your food will be sprayed with pesticides, which will sicken you, whether your taxes are going to be raised, um, whether your favorite uh, podcast or YouTuber will be censored. Um, those are dictated by corrupt, distant, and tiny bureaucracies, which you have no control over. And you could never even um, dream of challenging the kinds of decisions they make because they're not even really their own. They're just reduplications of the technical needs of the system itself. So the there can't be a, um, an equilibrium between nature and technology. He provided the allegory of a, a man with uh, a neighbor who would come back uh, once a year and take half of his land. And um, eventually that um, half that he has remaining becomes so small that it's effectively non-existent. Okay, it might still technically be there, but you, it's like the uh, incredible uh, shrinking son of man with uh, Robert M. Price. Uh, you know, when you remove everything from the New Testament, which is not historical, says uh, mythicist Robert M. Price, um, you might have a name, Jesus, but at that point, he's effectively become so small that there's nothing there. And that's basically what happens with freedom under um, technology, says Kaczynski. Um, each advance within the system takes away a little more freedom. And uh, we're already to the point where um, the, the number of venues where you could still actually have it are, are, are so small um, that uh, they're, they're effectively gone. And um, so the, I think that's another important thing to mention, which you, you brought in and so we've briefly touched on is that our freedom is now entirely what Ted calls a surrogate activity. And these are activities which basically just replace our idea of power so that our freedom is found within things which aren't truly free, correct? Right. So for Kaczynski, the difference between technology and nature is not that any one object intrinsically belongs to one or the other. That's how we usually think of it, by the way. We usually think that some objects are inherently technological, like supercomputers, for example, whereas other objects are intrinsically natural. We think of like trees in the forest, etc. cetera. Um, and, and he shows that that's actually not true. No one object is in one category or the other. There's a certain possibility for anything to be given, to be construed, as I, I, I borrow the term from Sean Peterson, in either direction. And this counts for um, humans as well. Uh, humans seem to be natural biological organisms. Um, but uh, under the influence of modern technology, we ourselves simply become technological. Okay. So, um, so, so what are these surrogate activities? Well, surrogate activities are um, largely activities which um, some corporation makes money from you doing. So it's not even a matter of somebody um, inventing their own hobby, so to speak. It's, it's really a way for you to divert what little money you have into some pastime, which, of course, uh, has to be bought from some corporation. And it's no coincidence that uh, the kinds of surrogate activities which are openly promote, prom promoted by the system uh, are ones which uh, require uh, them. And you could think of it, even in the case he mentions of, uh, of uh, spirituality, for example, the, the kind of spirituality which um, you had before technology emphasized things like 
um, abstaining from material consumption, right? Uh, but to the extent that religion is allowed to exist today, you actually have the exact opposite, which is the prosperity gospel, the idea that God rewards those who um, are good by giving them high paying jobs, money, uh, financial success, etc. So the idea that no one thing is technology or nature, it has to be construed that way. You can have this sort of contrast. You look at the, the prehistory of, of something like spirituality before technology and look at what happened to it after it was allowed to uh, continue existing within the technological system. So um, what do you personally make of... Uh contemporary western culture sort of uh a hyper consumption of you know porn netflix binge eating binge drinking what do you what do you make of this in in a kaczynski and from a from a kaczynski perspective so on one hand uh kaczynski acknowledges that the technological system is permissive in the sense that um this sort of unbridled consumption you just mentioned is no longer seen as a vice as it, as it might have been uh, centuries ago for example it's actually promoted as your ethical duty in, in a postmodern society with with no hope of any enduring or transcendent values of a spiritual kind uh, we've we've just accepted that that quote unquote doesn't exist the only thing you can do with life is to just enjoy whatever pleasures um, the technological system itself generates for you. And if you consider um, specifically the the sexual prohibitions of, of say, the Victorian era, um, those have been so overturned that now it's your ethical duty to not abide by the old expectations of a heteronormative monogamy, um, let alone uh, maintain the traditional extended family. Um, your, your duty is to be a consumer of sexual experiences as such. And he notes that um, self-propagating systems, which uh, modern technology is just one example, they, they're basically amoral by human standards. Um, even viruses, which are not alive, they still embody the same sort of uh, orientation towards out-competing rivals in a process of, of natural selection. And we're finding this out right now. Is we're, we're waging a battle against um, a, a virus in a pandemic, and uh, and uh, it's up to the the uh, um, up to the listener to evaluate how successful that is going. Um, but the, the same um, sort of teleology without morality in the human sense holds for the technological system as a whole. Um, and technophiles like Ray Kurzweil are unspeakably naive to assume that human values, like maintaining our existence into the indefinite future, even after we've lost any usefulness, um, to assume that the technological system would, would do that, <laughs> even when it had no reason, um, it's unspeakably naive. And it's, it's a misunderstanding of the self-propagating system uh, precisely on rational grounds. On the other hand, I will emphasize, because each technological change is bigger than the last, uh, because technology is simply hardwired to advance beyond its own pre-given limits with each innovation, it logically follows that each change will contradict hundreds of thousands of years of human evolutionary adaptation more than the previous one did. So the despair which you feel from living under these conditions will be stronger with each um, uh, uh, with each advance that the technological system has. Therefore, the doses of whatever drug of choice you need to block it out will have to become more powerful. And if you consider um, pornography as, as an example, which you brought up um, in particular, um, it kind of reminds me of the uh, plot for the original um, pilot of, of Star Trek. The, the original Star Trek, um, an episode called The Cage, was uh, rejected in the 1960s as, as being too abstract, um, so they, they changed it. But uh, it, it really is something which I think uh, should be, um, should be uh, watched by anyone who's uh, curious about uh, evaluating the effects of living under excessive uh, technologization, because in the episode, uh, Captain Pike, rather than Captain Kirk, is uh, trapped in a, a technological simulation generated by aliens who trap him on their planet. And uh, the girl in the simulation uh, tells him that, look, he's still basically free because he can customize her to be any woman he can imagine. And I think this is exactly the situation uh, we're in now in which we have this ability to customize the technological simulation precisely on sexual grounds and is cited as uh, proof that we're still free. And this is something which uh, the porn industry openly uses exotic race as a marketing category. Um, the idea is that you can basically play God by reaching into the innermost 
category of personal identity. Yeah, you know, not just tweaking the uh, hair color or the eye color, but really the simulations race itself. You can change the girl from Brazilian to uh, Italian, a uh, Peruvian, British, Japanese, anything you can desire. And yet the irony is that rather than have unlimited power to directly generate on the outer world, anything you can imagine on the inner world, uh, to use uh, John Michael Greer's terms, um, the, what happens is you really just lose your own inner world of imagination. Uh, sex addiction therapists note that uh, their clients ask them why uh, excessive consumption of pornography eventually uh, creates uh, a situation in which they need to view uh, shemale and homosexual content just to get aroused, despite identifying as 100% heterosexual themselves. And I think the answer, if you will admit, is that under modern technology, you don't really spontaneously desire anything yourself. You just reduplicate whatever content has been uh, generated by the industry itself. And this effectively reduces you to a cog in the system is conducting a force of electricity from one link of the chain to the next without any agency on your own part. Behind the illusion that pornography allows you to basically play God by tweaking the simulation at will, the reality is that you're the one who's being customized, even to the point that your deepest desires vanish, be replaced by foreign intruders. And this is why Ted Bundy, for example, before he was executed as you know, the most uh, notorious serial rapist of all time, said that the system was kidding itself to think that getting rid of him would be good enough. And most people forget that Bundy specifically cited the development of technology with uh, making his own uh, ventures of uh, riding his bicycle through back alleys looking for people's discarded uh, dirty magazines in their garbage. That, that had long since been rendered obsolete. And he was warning people that it was precisely the development of technology, which was continuing in the background, even as they executed him. So that we have this system where our, our, we have a sort of pseudo freedom given to us by technology, which eventually we sort of realize is not really satisfying our power process. And so that 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 thing in itself needs to grow bigger and bigger. So so really technology just is is a, a positive feedback loop towards decadence and amorality. It is an essentially amoral system by the standards of humans. And this is because uh, the self-propagating system in itself makes no presuppositions about the existence of us. It works equally well with viruses who are not alive, and it works equally well with uh, robots who truly are not alive either. Okay, okay. And do you, consider, um, do you consider Ted a reactionary then, or is he beyond this form of political thought? Because, because one of his sort of, shall we say, overarching enemies is this notion of progress, which is sort of tied in with technology. I think that on a structural level, you could make uh, something like that argument because progress for Kaczynski definitely is, you know, the enemy. And you can find similarities with uh, someone like Julius Evola. You know, they, they both agree that progress itself is a misnomer. All of the things we consider progress are actually signs of decline. These are uh, symptoms of a, a civilization in, something, uh, in, in which something else has gone wrong. And Kaczynski was very specific in his uh, 1971 essay, uh, Progress versus Wilderness, that under modern technology, progress really only has one meaning, and that is the advancement of the system on economic and technical grounds. Because such a system will treat any unpredictable element as an obstacle, which has to either be coerced into being a cognitive system or else outright uh, eliminated, progress can only happen, therefore, if you bring nature under the control of the system, and on a human level, that means you will negate the individual's freedom to the point that eventually it vanishes. And it's important to emphasize that even if you have claims of social progress, which are you know, so fashionable today among uh, you know, the same corporations that are, that are uh, advancing this technological monstrosity, um, they're only promoted if they advance some technical interest of the system in disguise. And... Um, the claim for 
progress to be happening on a humanistic level once again misses the point that the kind of progress we have on it within the technological system makes no presuppositions about our standards of morality. I think that one difference from traditionalism and, and Evola at Guénon, for example, uh, which you find in Kaczynski, is that uh, for Kaczynski, the ideal state is uh, more like a hunter-gatherer band of about 100 people, which was the norm for, he says, the first hundreds of thousands of, of years of a human evolution. Um, I don't think Kaczynski's as interested in like the ancient caste system and aristocracy, which uh, Evola and Gainal uh, were, uh, were uh, interested in, but there's still an agreement among them, I think, that technological modernity is largely a negative phenomenon. Um, for Evola, this is what happens when spirit is blocked out hermeneutically. And Kaczynski, this is what happens when nature is blocked out. One thing just specifically with um, the philosophy is you you bring in a lot of the, the ideas of appearance and presence and the what happens to these ideas of appearance and presence with respect to the human once technology is sort of introduced. And I just wondered if you could um, expand on this because it was quite an interesting passage. So uh, Heidegger, long before uh, Ted Kaczynski had, uh, had, had talked about all this, uh, he emphasized that etymologically speaking, the word techne in Greek um, is not the narrower uh, modern definition of technology as a set of artificial machines, plain and simple. Um, the Greek term techne really is a way of coming to appearance. And the technological change in modernity was precisely that, a change in how things come to appearance. Heidegger uses the word uh, standing reserve as this uh, strange way for objects as such to disappear. Um, you have stockpiled material, which can be summoned on a moment's notice for some industrial project, but objects as such um, are no longer possible. And the biggest uh, delusion that man has in this situation is thinking that he's the master of this operation um, when he too is reduced to standing reserve. So Heidegger emphasized that technology is not the application of science as we usually think. Modern science already is modern technology because you can only do modern science if you have precisely this change in how things come to appearance. Jacques Ellul, a little later, um, made a very similar argument by, uh, by, by saying that technology is not just physical machines, as we usually think. It's also social technology. You have propaganda. You have psychology. You have sociology. Uh, there's epistemological technology. You have chemistry, physics, which the common denominator is that technology is any artificial system of rationalization, which replaces some spontaneous expression of life with a set of strict forms uh, oriented towards maximizing adaptability and efficiency. That's what technology is. And in an obscure letter from prison, Ted Kaczynski actually agreed with both Heidegger and Elul. He says, technology is uh, something which must be thought of, I would argue, more as a mode of construal. As I mentioned before, any object could be given as technological, or it could be given as natural. The question is the uh, is only whether the system uh, as a whole allows the kind of freedom for it to be given naturally, or whether that sort of freedom is uh, is hardwired to be removed. Is there a way out of this? Is there a possibility of exit and retrieving some sort of freedom? Is that a possibility for Ted? Well, I think that uh, the question of the objective factor, to use his own term, um, will uh, be necessary to examine whether there is a possibility to, to get out of this. Uh, indeed, many revolutions against technology, uh, or excuse me, many revolutions against the system are, are not real revolutions, as you would say, because uh, precisely because they get the objective factor wrong. So in a uh, letter uh, written from prison, um, he use the term objective factor to uh, describe that on which everything else in a given historical situation uh, is dependent. Uh, many thinkers agree that there is one, they just can't reach consensus uh, over what it is. So for Marx, the objective factor is capitalism and therefore transitioning to uh, communism is, is good enough because you uh, change the objective factor. For uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, it's, it's not so much capitalism, as it's taxation. It's just the state-sponsored coercion, which creates 
uh, dysfunctional and wasteful public goods bureaucracies. That's the problem. So we can have anarcho-capitalism as good enough because the objective factor is not capitalism, it's taxation. For Michael Rupert and uh, Richard Heinberg, now the objective factor is petroleum and, and fossil fuels in general. And both of these approaches, they would say, um, are unsatisfactory because they maintain those fossil fuels. For John Zerzon, it's even more radical. Now it's agriculture. And the only sufficiently meaningful response is to literally return to hunting and gathering, and even things which seem to be nostalgic reminders of the pre-technological past, like uh, plows and writing are still, he says, part of the problem. For Kaczynski and Elul, the objective factor is technology, and this is why he emphasizes um, right at the very beginning of the manifesto that uh, his revolution is not a political revolution because changing the president in office, using the American example, um, changing the political party of, of the people in Congress, um, but maintaining the technological basis of society is really not going to change anything. And communism in particular, Kaczynski cites as, as a pseudo rebellion because it still needs industrial production. It needs global distribution networks, um, rapid transportation, communication technologies, um, the objective factor is such as maintain. And I think a, a kind of a recent example of, of this a disagreement over the objective factor you could find with um, Anita Sarkeesian and Feminist Frequency. She basically argues that the objective factor is uh, sexism uh, rather than technology. And her campaign to uh, make video games abide by the same standards of political correctness, which have already taken over the uh, Hollywood film industry and television. Um, she's arguing that uh, that's necessary because it's not so much a matter of democratizing technology's benefits for everyone. Rather, we have a duty to uh, see to it that the right people get a disproportionate share of technology's benefits. We need to artificially rig the technological system itself to serve as a sort of virtual reparation granting machine. This would allow, quote unquote, disenfranchised groups to get revenge for wrongs committed generations, maybe centuries ago. And she says there will be no justice unless the system allows those who claim to be intersectionally oppressed to claim a larger share of the pleasure from technology by turning video games into a way for women to dominate um, to dominate men, uh, both uh, virtually and, and by extension politically. And if you really examine this argument, she's just saying that we can only correct the problem in reality if we change the, techn the underlying technology. Uh, by reaching down into the algorithms themselves to hardwire them to fur further social justice causes. And this is exactly what Kaczynski would call the system's neatest trick, because the one thing you won't challenge in doing that is the technology itself. Does he give any... I, I haven't read um, Anti-Tech Revolution, Why and How, but I've heard there's a fair amount of... I might be wrong in this, but a fair amount of practical advice in there. Um, do you or Ted, is there any sort of practical advice with respect to how to begin to live a, a life which is at least moving away from technology or is that simply not possible because within technology it, every minor revolution does get subsumed back into its uh, its functions well uh, anti-tech revolution um has the uh, subtitle or um, the, the second half of the title as uh, both why and how because it does emphasize the sort of practical advice uh, that you've mentioned. And um, one of the things he does emphasize is you do have to have some sort of social organization. In some cases, there would have to be an element of secrecy, uh, but that's something which need not be um, exaggerated, that element. But you do still have to have uh, some sort of social organization. And this is because he emphasizes in the book that uh, uh, language is not enough. Preaching ideas is not good enough. And the illusion that history was changed by uh, people with original ideas is something which is even um, less true today than it might have been in earlier centuries. He cites the example of Martin Luther as a guy who lived during a time when the Vatican's control on intellectual activity was so strong that Luther was able to change more by having original ideas. But because of the democratization of, um, of, of uh, language that you've had since then with more freedoms for expression, at least nominally, because of the problem of uh, diminishing returns at this point, having an idea alone really won't accomplish anything. And he mentioned that uh, the uh, time when such a change to the system could take place, that is when you have a political movement which has become powerful enough 
to overturn the technological system, but not yet so powerful that corruption becomes inevitable. Um, if the only thing you can do at that moment is, uh, is tweet, you're not going to be able to change anything. You have to have some sort of practical action. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there anything you'd, you'd like to add or anything that we haven't added in that you think is important for uh, Ted's work? So uh, once again, thank you so much uh, for this discussion. Um, I think it's a very important topic, which uh, uh, does need to be given more attention, the, uh, the problems of technology, um, as well as Ted Kaczynski's own interpretation of them. And I think that uh, Ted Kaczynski's emphasis on technology is something which uh, really does differ from these other maybe uh, interpretations of the objective factor. It is uh, something which really cannot be explained away even through, uh, say, the fossil fuel argument uh, or l- let alone the capitalist argument and all these others. I think that focusing on technology as such um, as the objective factor of our historical situation um, and understanding the particular maybe rationalized laws of how technology behaves, as we've uh, discussed uh, uh, today, um, the amorality of it in pursuing its own interests, etc. I think it's something which definitely needs to be understood because um, even people who um, uh, claim to be, for example, uh, uh, radical environmentalists like uh, David Class, they still assume that no matter how bad things might get on environmental grounds, uh, the technology is never going to be a problem. Uh, David Class had a novel about, you know, a thousand years in the future. A environmental damage has become um, uh, absolutely um, unbearable, but the machines are still serving us. And in fact, you don't even need to press buttons. They simply read your mind and do whatever you tell them. That is unfortunately uh, an, uh, a very common way of thinking about it, even if you're willing to um, imagine uh, draconian environmental scenarios, etc. you still assume that technology is never going to be a problem. And yet we've already reached the point where it is. And I think that's something which has to be emphasized. Okay. Okay. Um, whereabouts can we purchase your, your book? So the uh, philosophy of Ted Kaczynski is available on Amazon, uh, both ebook and uh, paperback editions. Okay. Okay. Chad Hogg. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you so much.